Hello, everybody, and welcome to our sixth lecture in our class F 10s Autonomous Racing. Today, I will talk about a very important topic, which is called vehicle states, vehicle dynamics, and map representations. With this topic, today, we will close the fundamentals of autonomous driving and close the fundamentals of robotics, because today, you learn how a vehicle behaves and why it behaves like that. In the next couple of 40 minutes, we will talk about vehicle states, vehicle dynamics modeling, vehicle dynamics simulation, and last but not least, map representations. Although that this field is heavily now focusing on the vehicle states and dynamics, the map representations are important to understand what kind of maps can be used for our vehicle where it moves afterwards. But let's start with the first topic right away, the so-called vehicle states. We have a dynamic system. A car is a dynamic system which has nonlinear behavior and linear behavior. In our case, when we describe a dynamic system, we describe it with the help of ordinary differential equations, so-called ODEs. To describe a dynamic system, we have so-called states. In this, in this case here, states X. And these are variables which allow us to formulate the system behavior in form of a set of first order ordinary differential equations. We have an input for our dynamical system. We have then vehicle states that help us to describe the system. And finally, we have an output of the system. And just think about our car. As an input, we could have like the steering angle. Then we have states that describe the vehicle behavior. And finally, we see a vehicle behavior. For example, what you can see here is that we have an input to our system, a step function, and we have a certain output based on the dynamics that our system has based on a few seconds you see here. A step function in that case leads to a linear and nonlinear behavior of the output system. And that's more or less just a refresher for you of the system dynamics. What we use or what we want to define in this lecture are the so-called vehicle states. A vehicle state helps us to define a vehicle behavior or a vehicle position, a specific state in its respective environment. We use vehicle sensors to derive the vehicle states. For example, a global positioning system, the GPS, we can use odometry like a gyrometer or wheel speed sensors, what you see in this image here. Or we could even use our optical sensors like a camera or a LIDAR. All these sensors can be used to derive vehicle states. Sometimes the vehicle sensors output these vehicle states directly. Sometimes we need some special algorithms that help us to derive the vehicle states. When we talk about vehicle states, the first one that comes into mind or the first one that you need to learn is a so-called position. The position defines a coordinate vector relative to a global or local coordinate system. Just have a look in the right. In the left down corner, you see the zero. And this is like our absolute position. Our car is now driving on the racetrack here on the left and we can define respective to the vehicle center of gravity, a position. This position is called X and Y, and this position is defined in meters. That means our car has only a translation in our coordinate system. And in our case, it would be an epsilon position, 3.8 meters, or an X position, 2.5 meters. Of course, that sounds probably very trivial to you, but X and Y position, the position in our coordinate systems is one of the fundamental vehicle states. And we always define it with X and Y, 
And when we come into the third dimension, we define a Z axis. The second vehicle state is called heading. Heading defines an angle that displays the direction in which the vehicle currently looks at. So what you can see here, our vehicle is currently looking into the north. And we define an angle either in degree or in radians that is respective to the x-axis of the coordinate system. Again here, the origin of our environment needs to be known. Because if we don't know where the x-axis lies, we don't know what, where the right heading is. Be careful here. Sometimes when you like use algorithms from the internet or coordinate system transformation or coordinate system explanation, you see that the heading angle sometimes is deriving, is, is going from minus pi to pi, which means minus 180 degrees to 180 degrees. Or sometimes it's from zero to two pi, which means from zero degrees to 360 degrees. In this case, the car only has a rotation around its Z axis. Again, here on the left side, you see a zero to pi heading. What you see here is that we're going from zero degrees to 360 degrees to the left. And on the right side, you see from zero to 180 degrees, which means from zero to pi. And again, on the right side, from zero to minus, minus pi to minus 180 degrees. What you can see here is that the translation between the left side on the right side is pi divided by two, half pi, either minus or either plus. Which means if you know that you are in one coordinate system, perhaps on the right, you can add or uh, decrease it with minus pi half, and then you can translate yourself from one coordinate system to the other one. The third vehicle state we define now is in the so-called Frenet frame. Frenet is a continuous differential curve in a three-dimensional Euclidean space. And the Frenet frame is defined as the coordinate system spanned by the tangential vector and the normal vector at any point at the reference line. What you can see here on the left is that we don't have now an X and Y position. We define a so-called S position and a D position. The S coordinate represents the run length and starts with S point zero at the beginning of the reference path. What you see here in the left image, we see S is equal zero, and then we move along S, and S is decreasing with a certain step size. In addition, we define the lateral position relative to the reference path, and this is represented with a D coordinate, where the middle is D zero, and then we have like a value to the left, which is positive, and a value to the right, which is negative. In our case, what you can see here is D equals 0 0.5, 0, uh, 0, 1.0, and 1.5. This means we can define two new vehicle states. One is called the distance to the center line. This is the displacement in meters between the agent center and the track center. And the observable maximum displacement occurs when any of the agent wheels are outside a track border or depending on the width of the track border. On the right side, you can see that the other value, the S value, is the progress along the track. We have an n ordered list of track dependent milestones along the track center, and we start with s equals zero. The last one, in this case, could be s equals 50, is then at on the same position as s equals zero. And with this two, we can describe the vehicle's position in space, but a little bit differently than an X and Y position. And especially what we can do here is that with the left and right position, we can use it for decision making or the progress along the track gives us one value where we can find information about where we are.
This is more useful, for example, in path planners or decision makers. Then the next vehicle state is called velocity. Again, this sounds maybe trivial to you, but this is a very important state. It's very important that you understand that this is the observed speed of the vehicle and that we can measure it in both X and in Y direction. In this case, the X axis is measured in the coordinate system of the vehicle. And the X axis here is what goes longitudinal in front of the vehicle. Normally, what you see is the so-called absolute velocity. We can cal calculate the absolute velocity with the help of the lateral and longitudinal velocity. And that's the value you normally use. In our case, we measure this value with either GPS value or an IMU value or wheel speed sensors. Unfortunately, when you come to higher speed, these do not cover the wheel slip correctly. The only accurate measurement sensor we could use is a so-called pivot sensor. And you normally see that on those expensive race cars or Formula One cars, which is like the pipe that is going out of the front of the car. And normally this velocity is displayed in meters per second. The next vehicle state is called acceleration, which defines our observed acceleration when the vehicle changes its states. Like when we change from one velocity to the next, we have an acceleration occurring. Again here, acceleration is measure, measured in the X and in the Y axis. We call the one longitudinal acceleration and we call the other one lateral acceleration. Be careful here. Don't use acceleration as a common acceleration for the whole vehicle. Always divide between longitudinal and lateral acceleration. With this, you can define more in detail the vehicle behavior. You can explain it better to colleagues and you can have a better insight because high lateral acceleration does mean something completely different than high longitudinal acceleration. Normally, we measure the acceleration with IMU sensors that can measure it directly. And normally, we display this in meters per second squared. Finally, the last vehicle state for today is called the steering angle. The steering angle defines an angle that displays the direction in which the front wheels currently look at, similar to the heading. We define this angle with respect to the center line of the agent. This means we have a center line and based on how much we move the tires, we have a steering angle and we normally give this um, the, the value delta, steering angle delta. In our case, we can display it in either radians or degrees. It's based on what kind of simulation environment and vehicle environment do you use. When you look at vehicle states and vehicle dynamics, you then see that there are more vehicle states that you can use. There are some additional interesting vehicle states based on the vehicle dynamics, for example, the side slip angle. What you see in this picture, a side slip angle occurs when we are drifting, when the car is moving sidewards. That means we have our X axis of the car, but we have like a high velocity um, value, a high velocity vector is not aligned with these axes. And then what you see here in red, that's how we create the side slip angle better. Then we have the so-called slip angle, alpha. The slip angle alpha only occurs at the tires. And more or less, it's the, the angle between the tire moving direction and the moving direction of the contact plane. This slip angle alpha is very important because that's the reason why our car creates a lateral tire force. And finally, the so-called wheel slip when you see like the cars creating smoke is when we have a difference between the velocities on the tire and the velocity the car actually has. 
This vagal states are only for your overall knowledge to understand what we are doing now. You do not need to understand them in detail because this acquires further reading, but you need to know those vehicle states exist and you can use them for your vehicle dynamics modeling. The last point in this chapter is the most important one. We are not only teaching you the vehicle states or probably because you already know the vehicle states, we are teaching you that because you should use that to visualize. It's very important not to look at one number only. What you need to do, visualize all the measurement data to show trends, to calculate errors. And what is very important that you learn to interpret the signals. This divides you from a bad engineer. If you can do that here on a high and good level, you are a very good engineer. Because what you do is you look at singularities. For example, here in the heading arrow, we see like high peaks. There's something clearly wrong with our vehicle. Or you look at turns, or you look at overtakes. Or again, you show trends. Look at the steering angle in the low left corner. What you see here is like high oscillation of the vehicle. That gives you an impression that something is wrong with the vehicle and that we need to tune our steering controller. So this is very important that you use all the vehicle states you have and visualize them afterwards. This information, the vehicle states, brings me now to the next chapter, which we call vehicle dynamics modeling. And I want to ask you a question now. You see here, our car is driving along a trajectory. And you see now A, B, and C, three trajectories. And my question for you is, which trajectory is the car following? With the knowledge you have learned now, you probably might go for number B because you already see where the car is driving, you see the steering angle of the car. But unfortunately, we cannot tell. We cannot see what the car is doing here because we don't know anything about the vehicle states. We don't know anything about speed. We don't know anything about acceleration. We don't know anything about steering angle. Finally, we don't know nothing about the vehicle. What kind of mass does the vehicle have? What is the length, the width? So what we need to do is create an information about the vehicle's behavior or what we call the vehicle dynamics behavior. Why do we want to model something? So you can think about the car that we have some inputs, the steering angle. You as a driver, you have the steering angle and you have the motor torque with the acceleration. Then you apply that to the real vehicle, you get some outputs, you get a speed, you get acceleration, you get the vehicle movement. What we now do as an engineer, we want to create a vehicle dynamics model. So what we create is a simplified representation of our real vehicle, and then use the inputs and get the outputs. We do this by creating differential equation or characteristic curve correlations, for example, for the tires afterwards. Unfortunately, we have different models that we can use. And the more parameters we have, the better the model accuracy and the better the model match. When you look at vehicle dynamics, you see that they are like one vehicle dynamics model, which is like very, very famous, so-called single track model or bicycle model. And then I think a few of you might always also heard about the so-called double track model or even a multi-body simulation. But we can go one step further. We can do a finite element simulation. And the higher we go here with the simulation, the more accurate our vehicle dynamics behavior is getting. But unfortunately, the higher we, we move, the farther we need to move to the right side, the more parameters we need to have for our vehicle. And that's a little bit unfortunate because 
we want to be as accurate as possible, but that needs that. But then we need to know like a lot of information about the vehicle. And you can imagine, like as a student or an engineer, to get these specific information, for example, about the brakes here, like what is the diameter of the brake, how much or how is the caliber uh, created in CAD model, like this kind of information, only for example, a car manufacturer has. And as a research and student, you don't get this kind of information. So we want to learn about how we can create those models and how they can be useful for us. When we look at the vehicle, we have the X axis where we have like longitudinal acceleration velocity and where the car can roll. Then we have the pitch axis, which is our lateral acceleration and where the car can pitch. And we have finally the yaw motion where we have our vertical acceleration, our so-called lift. And these uh, six degrees of freedom, those define our vehicle movements. And always with respect to the center of gravity of our car. So the first model we will have a look at is the so-called single track model or bicycle model. Now this one is the most simple vehicle model that gives us the opportunity to model lateral vehicle behavior. An even simpler one would be the point mass model, but the point mass only goes in the longitudinal direction. And here we have now the possibility to model some lateral vehicle dynamics behavior. What you can see on the right side is our model. What we do now from the four wheels, we move everything to one axle and combine it. Our center of gravity is at the road level, and therefore we have no rolling, no pitch, no wheel load differences to the left or right, or even to the front, to the back. Our vehicle longitudinal speed is seen as constant in this case, and we have no vertical dynamics and use only small angles. Now, this is the single track model. The first single track models we have is the so-called kinematic single track model. What you can see here on the right is all the vehicle states we have. In our kinematic single track model, we have slow driving and slow speeds. So no racing at 300 with this model, not possible. We do a slow cornering, which means like we steer slowly and drive slowly around the corner. And virtually, we would not see any lateral acceleration because the change of the vehicle um, uh, of the, the lateral velocity is not as high or significant. There are no slip angles, no lateral forces, and our steering angle is the so-called Ackerman steering angle. Because what we have in our car, in the F110 car, and in most of the normal cars, is the so-called Ackerman steering. So we can calculate the Ackerman steering angle with the help of the radius we are moving in and the length of the vehicle. That is what we're using in the Pure Pursuit algorithm. So when you want to describe now the model of your vehicle with the kinematic single track model, you will see that we describe an input. Our input U is the steering angle and the velocity because we have a constant velocity. And then we have our vehicle states. That's what we learned before. We have our position, we have our heading, and then finally, we create our model x dot, which is a function based on the inputs and the x position. And what we use now, we describe, first of all, the x position. We describe the y position. And we describe the angle rate of our vehicle. And that's the three calculations we use, what you see here on the right side. And by having these values, by doing those calculations, by having the input, if you like fill in the input here, you get a certain output with the vehicle states we have and therefore create our position and therefore our movement of the vehicle. And that's all. That's, that's basically everything. Provide a steering angle, provide the velocity, use the equations you see here on the right side, and then get a specific vehicle output. 
And that's the kinematic movement of our car. The most simple behavior you can create. But our car is not a kinematic car. Our car is having lateral forces. So we are moving one step up in a single track vehicle and display the so-called linear single track model. So we want to plan evasive maneuvers closer to the physical limits. We want to consider important effects like an understeering or oversteering. And therefore, we create this steady state vehicle velocity assumption, what we had before, like our acceleration change is our acceleration is like non-existent. In addition, what we doing here, what, what we doing here is that we introduce now the so-called tire forces. And this is what you can see on the right side. At the tire, you see now a lateral force occurring. Our tire creates the contact between the vehicle and the road or like the tarmac. And that means our tire is the one part of the car that creates the forces, the longitudinal and lateral forces, so we can drive. A tire can apply more forces if there is a so-called higher friction coefficient. The friction coefficient is like the one value that defines the maximum lateral and longitudinal acceleration. Just think about a dry road or an icy road. In our case here, because we are at the linear single track model, we are defining a linear relation between the tire forces and the side slip angle. We want to model the tire dynamics now with the so-called cornering stiffness C. What does it mean? Again, we create our dynamic system. What we create is like an input, which is now our steering angle, no velocity in that case. We create our states, which is like the chassis side slip and the yaw rate. And we create our function, which is now having the information about how our vehicle behaves. So what you can see with A and B, these are our matrices that define the vehicle behavior. We have again here, the mass, the velocity of the vehicle. We have now here um, our, our lengths, we have our moments and we have the new value defined, the cornering stiffness. What you see here is now a linear relation between the slip angle and between the cornering stiffness and between the lateral tire forces. And what you see here, this is a linear relation. By using this value, you linearize the vehicle behavior. Unfortunately, when you look at the lateral forces of the tire, it's not linear. This is a nonlinear behavior. So we're going straight and then at high slip angle, at high slip angles, we have a nonlinear behavior of the tire. But in this case, what we are doing is we create, we like we cut off those high slip angle degrees because that's the area where we have like high steering angles and fast at fast speeds. What are we doing now? We're creating this cornering stiffness, which is basically just the lateral forces divided by the slip angle. And we can just define therefore one value, one value for the cornering stiffness and that value is very easy to get. And that's what you using in your F1 10 speak and in the F1 10's gym. But we would not be good engineers if we would not think about if we can make it even more better. And therefore we are using, or we are moving from the linear behavior now to the non-linear behavior of the single track model. We want to plan even better evasive maneuvers and we want to be even closer to the physical limits. So what would we now integrate is first of all, a variable velocity which is dependent on the longitudinal forces and on the longitudinal resistances. In addition, we extend everything now to a nonlinear tire behavior. 
which means now we don't have this linear behavior anymore between tire forces and a slip angle. We have now a nonlinear behavior. To create this nonlinear behavior, we need to integrate additional tire models. And one is called the Pachega Magic Formula, which was developed um, as an empirical um, tire model or even the Fiala. This means you need to now get to know additional tire parameters or empirically create uh, this tire parameters to use this tire model. So how does this look like? Again, here, we create now our vehicle states and our vehicle input, which is now an additional longitudinal force. And we have now more vehicle states like the position, the heading, the longitudinal velocity, lateral velocity, or even the yaw rate. In our case now, the most important part, I have not descriptive here all the formulations. The most important part now here is that we use now this nonlinear tire behavior. And that makes our vehicle closer to its real physical behavior. I brought you here an image so that you can see how the nonlinear tire behavior looks like and that our lateral forces and longitudinal forces are dependent on the slip ratio, on the slip angle in degree, and on the, lat um, on the, the lift forces you create from the car, like your normal forces. And what you can see down below here is a combination of longitudinal and lateral forces. And what you can see here, like this blue, this green, this red graph, this, this behavior, that's basically the limits of the car for a certain um, lift force and for a certain slip angle. I brought you now a video um, from the Indy Autonomous Challenge. And what you can see here is that the car is driving at a very high speed of like 230 kilometers an hour. This car is completely driving autonomously. And now I want you to pay attention. What you see here is that the car is spinning because we were exceeding the lateral and longitudinal maximum tire forces in that case. So now we learned about the linear, um, nonlinear, and kinematic single track model. The last one I wanted to show you just with a high level overview is the double track model, because we simplified a lot in the single track model. When we go to the double track model, we are having a more complicated vehicle model, but with this, we can model all dynamics. Each wheel is modeled individually. Each wheel has individual weight load. Each wheel has individual longitudinal and lateral forces. Now, what we can model is rolling off the car, is pitching off the car. We have like the wheel load differences from left to the right, or even the axle load differences from front to the rear. We have a variable vehicle longitudinal speed. We have like vertical dynamics and we can integrate more advanced tiring modelings like the mathematical or physical tire models. So this one is what is used in high professional vehicle dynamic simulations. But with this one, you have the most accurate vehicle behavior. The final question is, why do I need to know this knowledge? First of all, I explained to you that you need to now know this um, knowledge because you will show graphs and visualizations. But in addition, you need to know this modeling because you might work with or create vehicle dynamic simulations. These are simulation environments and simulation platforms that provide the correct behavior of your vehicle. So everything you saw now, all these models, they are the underlying knowledge in those vehicle dynamic simulation environments. So you need to know how these work and why there's like a difference from one simulation environment to the next. The second one is called state estimation. 
with, for example, the kinematic model, you can calculate how your vehicle has moved. Like, did I move now five meters to the right or five meters to the left? You can calculate that for state estimation and use that, for example, in the common filter. Or think about, you wanna predict the behavior of other cars around you by observing their states X and Y position and velocity, you can calculate their next move with a certain uncertainty. And finally, the most important one here is the usage of model-based algorithms. Think about the so-called MPC, model predictive control. We have our underlying model, you just have learned, be used for the prediction of future actions of our algorithm or model-based reinforcement learning, where we use the vehicle modeling for our agents that behave more accurately in the environment. So now we learned about the different vehicle dynamics modeling possibilities. I wanna just give you like a few more ideas about vehicle dynamics simulation. I wanna show you now an example of how a car can move and how it can look like in simulation environment. Unfortunately, I only found this video here with German language, but what you see here is like a static circle drive with an understeering vehicle. You see that we have modeled this vehicle in the simulation environment. We are increasing the speed and we see, and what you see here is that we increasing our steering angle and finally create more lateral forces. And this so-called closed loop, uh, sorry, open loop maneuver can only be done with the help of vehicle dynamic simulation. That's how vehicle dynamic simulation can look like. And you, you have like a wide variety of simulation tools you can choose from. For example, MATLAB, you see here are some blocks. MATLAB Simulink provides you with some blocks you can use out of the box. And they just wanna get from you the parameters of the vehicle and the input. That's what you learned before. And then you have, for example, here, a single vehicle um, track model or a dual track model or a 60 degrees of freedom multi model model. On the right side, you can see a company called IPG that has a software called CarMaker. Below what you can see on the right side is AVL, VSM is Vehicle Dynamic Simulation. And on down below, you can see that Unreal or Unity, those 3D computer um, modeling simulation environments have so-called plugins and one is called Vehicle Physics Pro. So you create, th these guys created like a plugin, which you can use in your Unreal or Unity environment to model the correct behavior of your vehicle. In our case, and what we can recommend for prototype development and simple vehicle setup is the common road vehicle dynamics package because everything is written in Python. We use this in the F1 Times gym. There's a good PDF and explanation what you can see here on the left. And the code is very easy to understand because they predefined functions which only requires you to give the input and then they provide the output what they do that they provide different model types for example what you see here the kinematic single track model or a single track model or a single track drift model it's just like a different naming or multi-body model which is like a double track model in this case the different parameters of the car are necessary so you need to identify them but it's very easy because you can install the package with pip and you have like the whole explanation and we use it in our gym. So if you want to do some, some work with vehicle dynamics, use this environment. And what you can do when you set up such an environment, you can do open loop maneuver or closed loop maneuver. Think about an open loop maneuver that you provide a fixed vehicle input, like what you see here, a sign of steering you behave independent of the vehicle reaction. Even if your vehicle oversteers, you still apply the sinus theory. But you wanna measure values that reflect the vehicle's behavior without driver influence. And this, you can identify how stable your behavior is or what kind of, for example, the step steering. Think about a double lane change 
on the highway. You want to see how good your behavior is. This is heavily used in vehicle development. What we are doing is you can see on the right side, so-called closed loop maneuvers. We are closing the loop with either driver or our AI controller, which means our autonomous driving system. So what you see here is, for example, that we are running on a racetrack and therefore have this closed loop maneuver. What we then can do is determine objective parameters to identify the vehicle behaviors. And now you, we're closing to loop to the beginning. You need to have here your vehicle states to identify the vehicle's behavior. And finally, what you can see here is a comparison of different vehicle dynamic simulation. What you can see here on the left side is a kinematic steering model, a single track model, um, and a single track model, and a multi burden model. And all of them are driving in a turn, but you can see that we have different X and Y positions. Therefore, different model types lead to different behavior. The more accurate the model, the more accurate the vehicle behavior, but the more accurate the model, the more parameters you need. And finally, tire dynamics is the most crucial part. Never forget that. So we come to the last part of this talk today, which is called map representations. And we need maps, vehicle maps, to know what kind of obstacles are around us. We need to know where these obstacles are, and we need to know how our vehicle represents its surroundings and we can use therefore different map representations, an occupancy grid map, a point cloud map, feature map, a semantic map, and finally an HD map. All of them have a different focus. For example, our occupancy grid map is good for small scale robots, or an HD map is the focus for real world passenger vehicle like a Waymo car. But first of all, let's create an example environment with obstacles on one streets and surroundings. Think about, you see here some trees, you see some houses, you see another car. And that's you with your ego vehicle. Your ego vehicle, we, we sit in this car and now we perceive the environment with a LIDAR, with a camera, with a radar and with a GPS. So we create the vehicle knowledge and the surroundings knowledge of our environment. The first thing we learned today is the so-called occupancy grid map. What we are doing is discretize the map. And what you see now in each of these discretized cells, we can have an occupied, a free or no information. What we use this is mainly for 2D mapping and with the help of lighter sensors. If we translate this environment now, we would see something like this. We see a free space, we see an occupied space, or we see even a space with no information because it's behind our 2D environment. And that's our final occupancy grid map, and that's what we're using in our F110 vehicle. For example, what you can see here is that what you get from the Google Cartographer is when you map a complete environment, and that's what you use in our F110 vehicle. So this is very, very easy to read, and it's directly usable for 2D path planning. It's relatively easy to create because you just need some information from the LiDAR, but it's very difficult to use in 3D. In addition, it has a limited precision for localization, and we need to define a fixed discretization beforehand. But especially for our F110 vehicle, it's very good to use. Then we move again to our environment. And what you see here is that we now create a point cloud. Again, we discretize our map here and we have LiDAR sensors that defines the area, like a number of beams, number of layers. And mainly we use that with 3D environment. In this case, it's only a 2D environment, but you can think of that you have like laser beams here that go into nowhere. We use that to create a so-called point cloud, and that's what you can see in this image here. This was mapped completely with a 3D LiDAR, and what you can see that this is very easy to understand and directly used for path planning, and also relative 
easy to create. Unfortunately, we need some very expensive 3D LIDARs, a high amount of data, and the inclusion of irrelevant information is also given. So we want to use that type, not for our iPhone 10 speaker, but for bigger vehicles. And what we get in the end is a very highly um, discretized display of our environment. For example, what you can see here on the right is a house and the trees and the different colors display, for example, different parts of the house. Number three is a so-called feature map. We define features for all objects that are around the vehicle. We create a map based on the camera and maybe LiDAR, and we define features like an information about an object that is prominent or distinctive part. The features are extracted from the environment as fixed points, and we can create 3D representations, for example. I only have here two examples for you. What you can see here on the left side is a line which represents a feature, or on the right side where we see the cars is maybe detecting features we as a human can't even understand. In, a, in addition, we don't have an information about the occupancy. We only create features that we can use afterwards. The advantage is that we have a low memory consumption and we can apply it in 2D and 3D. Number four is a so-called semantic map. What we do here is that we give each obstacle a semantics, which means a meaning. What you can see here is that we draw a boundary box and tell this is a tree, this is a house, this is light. And by defining semantic meanings for all objects that are around the vehicle, we have the possibility to make decisions or to use it for path planning or to combine it with additional object detection features. You probably have seen this picture on the left. This is like from the Kitty data set where each pixel in the camera is getting a semantic meaning. For example, blue one is a car, red one is a passenger, or this purple one, this red purple one could would be the road. This means we have different objects and classes and create additional information for our path planner. But unfortunately, this needs high computational resources and it's dependent on the object detection. And finally, the last one is called high definition maps. What we do here, we make usage of all vehicle sensors, LiDAR, camera, radar, GPS, everything we get, and we create a high definition, a high defined, like a very, very high accurate definition of road shapes, road markings, traffic signs, barriers, and have this high precise lane information afterwards, which helps us for the path planning and the localization and the decision making of the vehicle making. Just for example, here are like two images that explain how this high definition map looks like. And what you can see here, high information content is given with a high precision, but it, it's, it, it's expensive to create. It needs to be updated all the time and you need a high memory and bandwidth on the car. And therefore, we are at the end of today's lecture. I hope you had fun learning about vehicle dynamics, vehicle states, and about map representations for a car. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. Thank you very much for listening and have fun with our tutorial.